Thank you, Mr. Rector, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is, in a sense, a daunting moment for me because I'm accustomed to sitting behind speakers and listening to what speakers say to our graduates at final exercise. Uh, reflecting on what I might say that might be of some advantage or benefit to you today uh, and going forth, I've realized that I really do need to talk directly to our graduates, to those of you who are joining this family of alumni to which the rector referred. I want to talk a bit about habits of the modern mind, how we think, how we convert ideas or thoughts to action. And I want to talk a bit about outcomes, where you go from here, what you do with regard to good and evil in the world, what you do to see to it that the places to which you go are better for your presence there. On the 20th of August, which I think was a Sunday night of 2006, at 6 o'clock in the evening, at the university's first exercise, the convocation welcoming new entering undergraduate students. What was then our class gathered at the other end of the lawn, and they sat through the gathering twilight facing north, facing the rotunda, the original library of the university, the repository of knowledge, the place that this university's founder imagined as the university's heart and head. And they did it to hear my words of welcome and to some extent caution, and to join the honor system, and to hear words of welcome and to become acquainted with one another as we began the academic year that for most of you who graduate today was the beginning of your time here. So today, once again, on the occasion of these final exercises, you gather as a larger class, pulling together all of the graduates of all of the schools, graduate and undergraduate, here on this end of the lawn. But now you face, of course, the other way. You're facing the south. The direction to which you face has been reconfigured since the university was designed. The building behind me, in a sense, doesn't belong there. You're supposed to be able to sit at this end of the lawn and look out into the world. Look to the place, places to which you will go after completing your studies. But also, this end was conceived as the place to which the world would come in order to find its way into the university. And if you think about early prints of the university, as it was first understood in this country and abroad, remember the extent to which the view from this point back behind you is the view that introduced the university to the world. Mr. Jefferson intended this end of the lawn to be the open door. He saw this open door as an essential part of what he could leave to the republic that he'd helped to found. In a sense, this is a day of looking back on your time as a student here. I hope it is for you a time of expressing some gratitude to those whom we applauded earlier, family members, parents, spouses, teachers, mentors, close friends. It's also a day, of course, to celebrate you and your achievements. During your time here, you have made your marks both as individual scholars, intellectual citizens in the making, if you will, and as a class. You've participated in discourse defined by academic rigor and by the decree that we will follow truth wherever it may lead in this place a decree that I urge you to tuck away into your heart and your mind and take with you, and that we will tolerate here any error so long as reason is left free to combat it. Tuck that one away, too. It's a rule of life in this republic. You've wrestled with complexities, and you've wrestled with ambiguities. In the process, if you've been fortunate, perhaps you've also developed or discovered within yourself a measure of one element of the modern mind, one that became a part of the language of intellectual discourse in this country in the early 19th century, when as a very young man, the English poet John Keats wrote to his brother and sister-in-law a letter that gave shape and substance to the modern mind. He described in that letter what he called negative capability, the capacity to live in a state of uncertainty 
in a state in which not every incongruity is resolved. And yet, despite the fact that all is not demonstrable to live truth itself. In Keats' case, the truth was to become one of the great poets of our language. In your case, it may be many other things, but in any event, the sense of reality and a condition of ambiguity is one element of the modern mind as we experience it. During your years here, you've learned independence. You've lived a life of self-reliance. You've belonged to a unique culture defined by principles of honor, of civility, of mutual respect, of service to the common good. You don't leave this culture behind when you leave this place. You take it with you to the communities, the careers that you will enter after this day. In thinking about this speech and thinking about you, I began thinking about two founding figures of our own American culture who also contributed first to our national narrative and then to the ways in which our minds as citizens in our time work. Thomas Jefferson, uh, someone we all have learned to know up close and personal, like it or not, it's simply part of being here, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, both of whom defined aspects of our minds. Each in his own way, of course, helped to shape the early republic and helped define the American experience. Jefferson, a political leader, author of the Declaration of Independence, and other documents on which we ground our concept of democracy, and Emerson, philosopher and essayist, the great poet of transcendentalism, America's contribution to the Romantic era. Both men, in distinctive ways, set the mold for what it is to be an intellectual, to live the life of the mind in America. In August of 1837, some 11 years after Jefferson died, Emerson spoke to the Phi Beta Kappa Society at Harvard. His topic was the American scholar. At that time, six decades after we had achieved our independence from England, America and its culture were still heavily influenced by Europe. Emerson and other thinkers of his time wanted to break the bond to Europe. They wanted to turn away from the old world and to forge a new national identity. And his address, which if you have not read recently, go find. It's on the web. It's worth reading and thinking about what we are as intellectuals. Emerson defined a framework for building a distinctly American cultural identity. Oliver Wendell Holmes later called the speech our intellectual declaration of independence. In the speech, Emerson encouraged American scholars, American thinkers, American intellectuals, each of us, to learn from the past through the study of great literature and art, but also to think independently to avoid becoming what he called a parrot of other men's thinking. In the ultimate point of the speech, he encouraged scholars to convert their study into action. He said the true scholar grudges every opportunity of action passed by as a loss of power. The statement echoes Thomas Jefferson's arguments that all science, all learning in the American university must be useful and that knowledge itself is power. If we turn around Mr. Jefferson's argument, we may assert that learning becomes worthless when left unused, that knowledge not converted to action loses its power. Now this raises a question for all who go forth from this place today with the privileges and the obligations of an education here and of entry into the community or fellowship of educated women and educated men. What will you do with the knowledge you've acquired here? How will you act in the world? Will you use your learning? Will you derive power from your new knowledge? And if you do that, how will you use that power? And what difference will it make to the world in the generation for which you become responsible as you go from here today? These questions occur within context, of course, and the context include the reality of good and of evil in our culture. I'm using the terms here in the secular sense. They have to do with both personal and public concepts of good and evil. 
Just as our university has not been perfect in your time, the world to which you go is flawed and in some senses corrupt. In many parts of the world, evil rules and visits destruction and inhuman conditions of life on those least deserving of it and least able to protect themselves from harm. Unjust war, civic unrest, political oppression, and military atrocity, acts of senseless violence that dumbfound us with their cruelty and disregard for human life. These have been front page stories in the newspapers with which you've grown up. They have been part of the culture in which you have lived to this point. They are an element of the ambiguity that John Keats described as the characteristic of the modern mind. Sometimes dishonesty is or seems to be rewarded and integrity ignored. And yet, goodness also has existed in your time as a student here. And it exists also in the worlds to which you go from here. It exists, though, with the condition that good in the world to which you go now becomes yours to foster, to create. You have the capacity and the obligation to fight evil and inequity. Albert Camus wrote that evil is in the world almost, the evil that is in the world almost always comes out of ignorance. Knowledge then is evil's first enemy and good's first line of defense. The challenge of course is for you to use what you've learned here in the role of agent for good. You've presented yourselves today well prepared to accept that challenge. Let me talk about you for a moment, some examples of what I'm talking about. Carlos Cueto came from Cuba to the United States in 2004 at the age of 19 with two goals, to learn English and to earn a college degree. It took him 15 months to achieve the first goal. Carlos learned English. He achieves his second goal today and he will go from this place to study law next year at Tulane University with the intention of becoming an international lawyer serving the United Nations. Savannah Kuzli and Diane West. <laughs> we brought a lot of friends today. <laughs> Both students in the Curry School's teacher education program will go to teaching jobs in Bangladesh after their graduations today. Ben Christinger, an environmental sciences major in the college, will go to a National Science Foundation fellowship to study the role of food systems in community development and of urban revitalization. He will begin his research here while pursuing his master's degree in urban and environmental planning in the School of Architecture. Madeline Wright, a chemistry and art history double major in the college, will work as a chemist in an explosive unit, explosives unit at the FBI Forensics Lab in Quantico. Mary Nguyen, an Access UVA student and leader of Who's for Open Access, is earning degrees in biology and linguistics. She will pursue a master's degree in the public policy program at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Finally, Erin Thompson, who receives her law degree today, will join a National Forest Service team that analyzes the potential environmental impact of proposed project developments on federal land. These women whom I've, and men whom I've chosen as examples, and many others who are here today, are converting learning into power and into action as they move from here. They are deploying the power of useful knowledge, and we applaud them as we applaud every single person who completes the degree today. Earlier in these remarks, I mentioned John Keats. When Keats was 22 years old, the age that many of you are today, he wrote a letter to John Hamilton Reynolds 
in which he compared human life to a mansion of many apartments. If you take nothing else with you from this, take Keats' mansion in your mind. He described the first room in this mansion as the infant or thoughtless chamber. And he said that we remain in that room for as long as we do not think. But then he says that when we begin to think and to enter the world around us, we enter the second chamber of maiden thought, where our understanding of the world sharpens and we are intoxicated by the beauty around us, but also where we come to see that the world contains misery and pain and heartbreak. Just as we acquire this knowledge of the world's disappointments and complexities, the second chamber goes dim. And on all sides, many doors swing open in the third chamber of Keats' mansion. These doors lead to dark, unexplored passageways. At this point of choice, choice we feel what Keats called the burden of the mystery. And here we must decide for ourselves whether or not to act, whether we will step out courageously to explore these dark passages. Keats believed that he himself was at this in-between moment of deciding what to do when he wrote the letter. Implicitly, he argues that the steps out into the darkness, into unknowns, is the first step into the world where each person can discover, create, make, or do. This place becomes good because it is a possible place where you may go at this point in your life. Keats chose to become a great poet. You may choose to be whatever you will. That's the privilege of taking your degree in a small d democracy. Like Keats at 22, you know now something of the world's beauty and also something of its evils. Now doorways are swinging open all around you, and they lead to these unexplored passageways. Opportunities abound, but you must act. And the first action is to choose your door and step boldly through it. My hope for you today and for all of your futures is that you may enter your passageways with courage, with optimism built on what you have learned, with confidence that your preparations have equipped you well to explore, to discover, to create, to make good. And then may you bring light where before you there was darkness, where before you was only the possibility of good, and where from this day on life's choices are yours to make, to enact, to pursue. Our role as your faculty, in a sense, has been to push you to be alert, eager, intellectually capable, and tested women and men. We know what you can do. We believe in you. We've had the responsibility to prepare you to take charge, to exercise every right, and to fulfill every responsibility. We hope that we have taught you to flourish, to prosper, to make a difference in that sense all around yourselves. My Betsy's contribution to this speech is don't sweat the small stuff as you go forth. <coughs> Seek the company of women and men of vision, ambition, and worth. Test friendships on the basis of genuine human worth, not of what Jefferson called artificial distinctions among men. Not titles, not birth, not even accidents of wealth not appearance. Find friends of substance and build your community within that world of substance. Make yourselves mentors. Take the responsibility of being guides and servants to the aspiring young women and men who stand behind you in life's line. Give them the step forward that your faculty have tried to give you at this point in your lives. What goes away as you leave this place but comes back in memory and comes back in reality as you come back to visit in a different way your university. 
is the murmur that you hear in libraries or in study groups as people work together in the evening. The sounds of music, the sounds of people talking to their parents on cell phones as they walk through corridors or down the lawn. The sound of ROTC units running past in the morning on their morning workouts. The sounds of the marching band practicing in Cars Hill Field. The sounds of student life, sorority rush, joining other organizations, being together in the groups that define the community of student existence. The sounds of traffic. The sounds of carols sung right at the end of the semester as you'd really rather go home, but then you hear that music and you stay a bit longer. The sounds of children on the lawn during Halloween. <laughs> the chapel's bells. The cheers at games, no matter what the sport. <laughs> and the name of Yardley Love.